Can you survive an execution? Well, yes, it so happens that there are multiple accounts throughout history that prove it is possible. But was it divine intervention or just dumb luck? I'll tell you the stories and you can decide for yourselves. My name is Janine and this video is Surviving Execution. You're watching it on Now You Know. Between 1910 and 1920, Mexico was ravaged by a bloody revolution led by Pancho Villa. The Mexican government didn't take kindly to his supporters, and they did anything and everything they could think of to stop the uprising. This is why on March 18, 1915, a 25-year-old named Wenceslao Mogol was arrested by the Mexican Federal Police. He was being accused of participating in the revolution and the Mexican government needed a way to deter others from joining it. So for show, immediately after his arrest, he was taken into court where, in a matter of just moments, he was sentenced to death. Officers dragged him outside where a firing squad was waiting. Before he even had a chance to think about what was about to happen to him, they fired eight to nine shots, each bullet sporadically hitting across his body. And when it was finished, an officer gave him what they call a mercy shot directly to the head. This was to ensure death and to stop any possible suffering. They then just walked away, leaving Wenceslao laying right where he fell. I believe they left him lay there just for show so other people knew what would happen if they joined the revolution. The very next day, another execution was scheduled to take place. But when officers went to remove his body to prepare for the next monstrosity, his body had disappeared. This is where the story gets just a little foggy. Some people say he managed to crawl away and find help with his fellow comrades. Others say a church group came and rescued him, nursed him back to health. Either way, he actually did survive the shooting. Unfortunately, the mercy shot he was given caused his face to be permanently partially disfigured, Wenceslao also wasn't able to provide much detail of the event because he was suffering from amnesia from the execution. Now back in the day, it was believed that if you were able to survive an execution, then it was divine intervention, and they took that very seriously. There was no more attempts to take his life after that. In 1937, Robert Ripley invited him on the popular radio show Ripley's Believe It or Not to talk about his experience. It was there where he explained that he received the nickname El Fusilado, which translates to the executed one. Wenceslao lived to the ripe old age of 85, and then he passed away naturally. But he became a legend in Mexico, and his story has been passed down throughout the generations. In 2008, the popular British rock band Chumbawamba released an album called The Boy Bands Have Won, which contains the song El Fusilado, which tells Wenceslao's story. I'll post a link to the song in the description box. Now we're leaving Mexico and heading over to Scotland. Please fasten your seatbelts and prepare for takeoff. While we are in transit, please smash the subscription button and hit the notification bell. It just helps me to keep count of all my amazing passengers. Thank you. Oh yes, beautiful Edinburgh, a city that holds tight to its history and heritage a place I have on my bucket list to visit someday. One stop I would definitely be making would be to Maggie Dixon's Pub. It's located in Edinburgh's Grass Market. This specific area is where our next attempted execution took place many, many years ago. In 1702, Maggie Dixon was born and raised in Musselboro, where she was eventually married to a local fisherman. Shortly after the wedding, her husband did leave her, whether it was being commissioned by the Royal Navy or simply abandoning her, we don't really know as history is not clear on the matter. Regardless of how it happened, Maggie found herself alone and needing to find a means to support herself. She found employment at an inn in Kelso. That's also where she met the innkeeper's son. A short-term romance resulted in Maggie becoming pregnant. Now you see an unwed woman becoming pregnant during this time frame was extremely scandalous. The pregnancy caused many problems for Maggie. She would be facing backlash from the entire community. She would also likely lose her job. 
How could she then be able to not only care for herself, but also a child? Maggie had no choice but to hide the pregnancy, and that is until the baby was born prematurely. Now we do not know if the baby was a stillborn or if it passed away shortly after birth. Those details have been lost over time. Either way, Maggie now had the responsibility of burying the child. She couldn't even possibly afford a proper burial. How would she even explain where or how the baby came to be in the first place? Now stop and think about things for a moment. Try and imagine how she must have felt. She was about 22 years old, and she just gave birth to her only child. A child that would have been known as an illegitimate bastard. I'm sure she felt sad for the loss, but I'm also thinking she probably felt relieved at the same time, and it's likely that relief turned into guilt. She knew she needed to hide the baby, and she needed to do it quickly. It was then that Maggie walked down to the River Tweed. Now, it's not known whether she put the baby in the river or if she simply left it on the riverbank, but shortly after, somebody discovered the remains. An investigation pointed everything back to Maggie, and she was arrested. She was sentenced under the Concealment of Pregnancy Act. This stated that any person who concealed the birth of a dead child, whether a stillborn or the child died afterwards, could be condemned to death. Maggie was hanged on June 19, 1728, at the Grass Market Square. It was reported that she hung there for 30 minutes until finally being pronounced dead. Some versions of the story say she was cut down. Others say that the hangman loosened the noose with his own teeth. But regardless of how, she was eventually placed in a wooden coffin to be transferred for burial. The coffin then was placed in the back of a wagon. During transport, the escorts heard moans coming from inside the coffin. But of course, they assumed they were just hearing things, but the noise continued. So they theorized that the noise was coming from the wagon wheels as it bumped along the dusty dirt road. But then the lid of the coffin opened and Maggie sat up. Now I have to tell you, I've had my own paranormal experiences before. And if I would have been there, I would have just died of fright right on the spot. Now, after the escorts regained their sanity, Maggie was taken to a local doctor. She was given a clean bill of health and was even able to walk home on her own. As I stated earlier, back then they assumed survival of an execution was God's will, and since Maggie was already executed for her crime, she did not need to be hanged once again. Maggie lived another 40 years after her execution, but whenever she did show her face at the grass market, People would constantly tease her. They actually named her Half Hangin' Maggie. So if you ever go to Edinburgh, don't forget to swing by Maggie Dixon's pub. So we covered two survival stories so far from many years ago. We found out that if you're able to survive an execution, you get a cool nickname, the ability to go on the radio, you have your own story told in a song, you get a pub named after you, Oh yeah, and you get to live the rest of your life. But what would happen to someone if they were able to survive an execution in modern times? This leads us to Romel Broom. Now, I hate these types of cases, so please forgive me as I will not be going too much into detail of his crimes. In 1975, he was arrested and sentenced to 7 to 25 years for multiple robberies in addition to the rape of a minor. It was bad. But then they actually released him in 1984. Four months after he was released, he attempted to abduct a 12-year-old, but had failed as he was interrupted by two good Samaritans. Three days later, he did it again. Only this time, he was successful at kidnapping, raping, and murdering a 14-year-old. He wasn't caught until three months later when he attempted to take an 11-year-old. The mother of the child was able to intervene, causing Broom to be slowed down enough that they were able to get his license plate, and he was arrested later on that day. He was sentenced to death for his crimes. On September 15, 2009, he was escorted to the execution room, where he would be put to death by lethal injection. It was reported executioners attempted multiple times to get an IV line so they could inject the lethal drugs, but his veins kept collapsing. They finally had to give up after about two hours. Of course, 
This set things back, as now his lawyers were able to argue a second attempt would be cruel and unusual punishment, and it also would be violating double jeopardy protections under the 5th and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution. The United States Supreme Court declined to hear his appeal, and he was scheduled for execution again on June 17, 2020. But for unknown reasons, his execution was delayed once again and rescheduled for March 16, 2022. It just seemed no matter what, he was always able to avoid execution. Now, this is the part where I do 100% believe divine intervention happened as Broom contracted COVID-19 and died on December 28, 2020. So what do you guys think? Was it God's will in each of these stories or just dumb luck? If you would survive an execution, what would you want your nickname to be? Let me know in the comments. Now, there are many more surviving execution stories out there to be told. And if you want me to do a part two, just hit the like button so I know how you feel about this video. Until next time, take care, stay safe, and thanks for listening.